Hi everybody, Dennis Prager and Julie Hartman. I'm Dennis Prager. And you are? Julie Jartman, as someone called me in high school. Is that true? Yes. People don't forget the nicknames from high school. Oh, you know what I would do when I would write my homework? I would do Julie, and then I'd draw a heart, and then I'd draw a man. And I also called myself Big Heart No Man. Is that right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> At what age? I don't know, like 13, 14. That... I'd go, Big Heart No Man. Things haven't changed much. Oh, thank you. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> You still have a big heart. It was I'm picky with, I should say, big heart, very, very picky with the men. Fair enough. You have a right to be. It's Dennis and Julie, everybody, and we really do talk about life. Did you share the 12-year-old girl's uh, letter yet? No. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. Folks, Julie got a letter. Oh. I must tell you, when she read it to me, all I thought was, I can't really believe an under 13 year old wrote this oh it's beyond belief but i i really think it's worthy of sharing because people don't realize how much good they can do with little things if you let people know about dennis and julie especially young people this this could turn their lives around because it's so real and the real really affects people. You have it up? I do. Okay. And by the way, I'd like to tell the audience and specifically Elizabeth, who is the lovely young woman who wrote this email, the fact that Dennis remembered that, no no shade. You don't have a great memory sometimes. Correct. With stuff, with, yes. with just, you right. know, names. Yes, or it the, shows what an impact. By it, it the way, shows what an impact I, this just, had. I want to take issue with you. Oh, uh, here we go. This is. I, I know what you're going to say, and I agree with you. What? You forget names, but you don't no. forget concepts. No, no, it's about okay. what you said. No shade? No. Okay, what? I'm just going to shut up. She's a girl, not a young woman. Uh, okay, that's fair. Actually, as I was saying it, I, I well, I didn't want to say a young girl. No, just say I, I, we got a, we got something from a girl. For, I think of but her as right. a woman. Then, yeah, you're it right. It seems a little, you know what I mean? Even though it's not condescending, it seems well, little girl. I don't want to drop girl and boy from our vocabulary. That's the that's the only well, reason but I'm woman, reacting. But woman is the is binary. Oh no, not because of binary. Oh, no, I'm saying woman reflects the, the I know, boy, of course, girl. I know, but my, my reasoning has nothing to do with the binary nonsense. It's just that there's such a thing as a boy, forgetting, I'm not talking binary, I'm talking age. When I was 12, I was a boy. I hear you. It's more about inno- the problem of innocence rather innocence than gender confusion. And, and woman means adult adult female. You're right. I think that's a very good point. By the way, I called her a, a young woman because she's... No, I, no so I, I get it. I do get it. But I, right. I take your point. I think it's okay. a good one. Okay, let me read. So this is from Elizabeth. Dear Julie, my name is Elizabeth. I'm not going to say her last name. And I am almost 13 years old. By listening to the Dennis and Julie podcast, I learned that we have so much in common. I live in Boston, so I know the J.P. Licks ice cream place where you used to go. My mom and I go whenever we can. I lo- loved that ice cream store. Cappuccino Crunch, best flavor. Okay. I have a brother, but he's much older than I am. He's 29, but married. And we're really close. But since he lives in a different house with his family, I feel like an only child just like you. I adore your Dennis and Julie podcast. Sometimes I watch the same episode three times. It's so much fun. And I know, and I think I know a word that would really suit the show live. It's a very live show. If that's confusing, what I mean to say is that it's really about life. You have fun, but also talk the, about the good and the bad of life. It's about the real world we live in. And I think that's one of the charms of your show. I've always loved Dennis ever since my mom, and then she puts in parents, my parents are conservative, started showing me different conservative figures. I always felt Dennis was special. He's wise, but also so much fun. And I'm so glad I now hear him every week with you. You really are special. And ever since I started watching the show, I've wanted to know you. I think we could become friends. Mm. I really want to be an author, a child author. I write books and poetry and hope to have them published one day. I also want to influence people and touch their lives the way you and Dennis do. Thank you for all that you do for young people like me. I have the chills again. And She's incredible. I, 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 incredible. Everything about it is spectacular, including that it gives you hope for the future. She's 12 years old. But that's what is... Uh, did you write like that at 12? I will say... I don't mean it as a no, brag. No, no, that's I fine. Did. No, not a brag. I'm I asking did. you. I, I, 
I started writing well at at, at fifteen. I, I I could I don't think I could have written that at twelve. I have no idea, but I don't think so. In, in any event, it's not only well written and constructed and all of that, but it, it's deep. And I didn't even read. Uh... If, if she let me put it to you, forgive me, Julie. No, please. If if she'd have said, "Hi, I'm Elizabeth." I'm a 28-year-old uh, uh, living in, in Boston. Nothing in you would have thought, this doesn't sound like a 28-year-old. 20 old. Yes. That's what I'm saying. And as you said to me on the phone when I read it to you a few days ago, you said this would have, this would have been an impressive email had she been 30. Yes. And by the way, I, I don't know why I, I didn't read these because they're they're so fun. She wrote, P.S. I'm a bookworm. I also love A Series of Unfortunate Events by Lemony Snicket. That was my favorite series. What other books did you like as a child? One book you must read is The Westing Game by Alan Raskin. It's the best mystery and puzzler you'll ever read. I, I, I'm ordering it. P.P.S. I wanted to tell you my religion. Can you guess? She says, actually, I'm going to kick it over to Dennis. Can you guess her, her religion? Well, if she wrote, can, can you guess my religion? The assumption is she's not normative Christian. I, I, I that would, that, otherwise she wouldn't ask, can you guess? I don't, by the way, I don't think I told Dennis this on the phone. So no, 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 obviously not. Yeah, We're yeah. not going to, I'm not going to act like I'm cheating. I know. Just to uh, clarify. Uh, well, oh, 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 oh. I'll guess Mormon. No. Orthodox Christian. Oh, interesting. But, but it's a very, very good guess. I oh. bet you've never, I mean, I wouldn't have been able to guess it, right. by the way. Um, I bet you've never heard of an Orthodox Christian, but we're on the list with Catholics and Protestants. Please tell Dennis about us. I've always wanted him to know about us. I do, I do, in fact, and I'm scheduling a major Orthodox theologian on the show. Really? To learn more about Orthodoxy. She writes uh, just two more sentences. She says, we do believe that atheists can go to heaven if their actions are good. Maybe you can visit our church when you next come to Boston. What a, what a gracious person. Well, that's because I said that. And, and, and the fact that she resonates, I mean, that she picks up on these. How many 12-year-olds are thinking, can ath- good atheists go to heaven? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I would love to know. So how did w- you find us, Elizabeth? I'm going to write back to well, her. Well, she did because she said her parents listened to me. True. Oh, so oh, she, true. I was in her life. So now you're in her life. That's, a, that's a great gift. I we totally her. will be friends. By the way, she said, "I think we will be." Well, friends. here is a beautiful thing I I have done for you, and I am I can't tell you uh, how meaningful it is to me bringing all these wonderful people into your life. But the beauty is from twelve <laughs> to ninety. I know. And I, I, there are there are young women in the the uh, description. I I said there is apt to write to me. Stephanie comes to mind. Ruby. There are two girls who I've mentioned on the show. I think they're both eighteen years old. They're seniors in in high school, and they wrote to me. I consider them to be friends. They're they're listeners of the show. They are remarkable, deep people. You met Stephanie um, mm-hmm. when you went to Florida, I believe, and now they're friends. I, I, I put them that, in touch that's right. because I thought you guys, you guys are so alike, and now they they write to each other and they're friends. I, I, lo- I love bringing wonderful people together. You do an incredible uh, job of yeah. it. I don't give a bleep if I'm complimenting him too much. Dennis has so many wonderful people in his life, and you you have really, I mean, well, the, I you have, have done me a solid by uh, introducing me to them, the right, Shabbat I, crew, uh, and them to you, and, and, and I, I agree with you. And I love it. I love bringing people together. And I don't only mean, you know, men and women to get married. Any, any two people. I just want to give you one. I'm really, I knew, I knew as I live and breathe this would work. I, knew, I know you're going to say, and no, I was just The musicians? Her. Oh, I was going to say Astrid. <laughs> oh, Astrid and you. That, that's, that's correct. That, that gives me great joy. That was not a shock. This is not a shock, though, either. So I have a very close friend. Uh, in the San Francisco Symphony Orchestra and a very close friend in the Philadelphia Orchestra. And I knew they would love each other. And these guys are now so close. Uh, they, you know, they're magnificent musicians, but, but they have everything together. I'd like to tell a story that I feel comfortable sharing about Dr. Marmer and how our, our connection. But before I do that, I'll just say, there are people my age and younger and this was this was a a thing in high school i remember 
who don't like introducing friends to one another. They're, people tend, in, in my age oh, group, to be territorial with their right. friends. Yeah. And I'm not trying to give myself a gold medal here. I, I promise you, I know it sounds like I'm, I'm uh, congratulating myself. I never got that. I'm actually not congratulating myself because it would be more of a triumph if, if I wanted to be territorial, territorial but I overcame it. That's, I didn't even understand it in the first place. Right, right. You could have two of your best friends sit with, love each other, and then you could hang out not just with them one-on-one, -on -one, but together. Why wouldn't you do that? So here comes a cliche, which I don't like, but it's so true, I'm going to say it. Love is not a pie. Yes. Does everybody understand what I mean? If you take a piece of pie, then there's less of the pie. But it's not true for love. That's ve that's very interesting. You know, my mom was telling me ab about that a few weeks ago. She was just remarking that when you have more children, it's not that you love your right, other children you, less or there's yes, less love to go but around. But you know what? God willing, you will know this one day after you have your first child you really do think, I, I, I can't, I, I'm not going to love the next one as much. Really? Oh, every parent thinks that. It's inconceivable to them. Because how could you think I'm going to love the unknown as much as the known? And then, and then you do. <laughs> yes. And the fourth and the eighth, depending on how many you have, obviously. I have two, but it's exactly what happened. So I'd like to tell the audience a story about Dr. Marmer, who is Dennis's friend and my psychiatrist, which I feel comfortable sharing because we talk about him so much. And I think everyone should have a psychiatrist if they need one. So Well, everyone should have a good one. A good one, of course. There That's aren't a very many. So I, Dr. Marmer, it's so funny. We spend our appointments um, talking about the Torah. <laughs> I believe it. We do. Um, and it's it's wonderful. But anyway, I first sought Dr. Marmer out. This is really, you, you all are getting to know me. Two or three years ago, God, it must have been almost three years ago when I first went on to Dennis's show. The whole background is I emailed Dennis. He, invi he very graciously invited me to sit in and listen to an hour of his show. He invited me on to show, onto his show with the stipulation that, with the warning, I should say, that, that if I did so, it would have some consequences for me. I did go on his show, the video went on YouTube, and a lot of people in my life saw it and gave me a hard time. I lost friends, it was very painful. I'm not kidding, I thought I ruined my life. No one, I thought people are going to Google me, they're going to see this video, they're never going to hire me, they're never gonna date me, they're never gonna be friends with me, awful. So I sought out this psychiatrist at, at a recommendation of a friend, Dr. Marmer. I had no idea that he was friends with Dennis. No idea. That's not why I sought him out. It was a recommendation. I'm meeting with him. This is during COVID, so we're on the phone. And and I, I say that because I wish I could have seen his face. And I was I was like truly in a hole depressed. And I start talking to him and I go, Dr. Marmer, I know you don't know me and I don't know you. I have no idea what your politics are. But I just you know, I've recently realized that I'm inherently a conservative and I went on this guy Dennis Prager show and I said, I don't agree with everything he says, but I think he's really wise and smart. He on the other end of the phone must have been like, OMG, because they are best friends. They For do the 30 tour years. 30 years. They do the, the minion together. And I just said, I just ask you to put your because he's an L.A. Dog. I'm figuring he's super liberal and wants to like prescribe me some bad pills and revenge for my conservatism. Turns out he's, well, I shouldn't say that, but. He's, he, he is open. He's open. Um, and uh, he, anyway, he doesn't acknowledge that you guys are friends, which by the way was brilliant. Right. It was totally no, no, brilliant he's very of him. professional. Because it would have made me and feel better. And he never better. mentioned to me that you were a patient. No, he's, he's very, very professional. Um, anyway. It was just so funny because the whole time I'm like talking to him on the phone about how my life is ruined by going on your show and how I'm sorting through my conservative feelings. You know, I tell He's your friends story. With you. I tell your story all the time. And your words were when I had you on like six months later. So, Julie, what happened? Was I right? I predicted that bad things would happen to you and I warned you. I didn't I didn't want to pressure you in any way. You didn't. And I didn't. I, I, I was very, very neutral. So you said, I went into, I had two weeks of hell. I'll, do you remember saying that? I do. And then I said, what happened after that? And you said, I then went to heaven. It's true. It was such a turnaround. And you've still been in heaven. Oh, of course. Yes. It's been the best thing that ever happened to me. But I'll, I'll say that the end of the story is that 
this is the real kicker. Two days after I met with Dr. Marmer, do you know this part? I get these text messages from PragerU when a new five-minute video comes out. I am sit. I will never forget this moment. I am sitting on my phone. I get a text message from PragerU. New five-minute video out. Psychiatrist Dr. Stephen Marmer talks about the importance of growing up. I oh, I wow. almost dropped of my course, phone. Of course, of course. And and so then I go on to PragerU. I'm like, that's Dr. Marmer. That's who I. I was just telling. And then all of it kind of. And then I Google, and there are photos of you. And I'm like. I don't know whether to be angry or thrilled, but anyway, that's yeah. That was the blow to your what mind. What timing? Oh, I mean, the timing. That is. That's that. God. See, what did I tell you the other day? I had an imaginary friend growing up named Dennis when I was five, and then this Dennis comes into my life. God has these ways of he has sprinkling a sense of humor. Well, Sean said God creates coincidence, and I think that timing was so divine that two and you days know what later, I say, God created Sean. Well, that's that's debatable. It, it, it takes a divine being to construct the uh, show. I, I, I just for I just thought I'd throw that out. Back to Elizabeth. She's wonderful. We're we're very blessed of incredible viewers. I I'm sure you will meet one day, and I look I, forward to it. I, I I know you do. Well, I'm just happy that what is happening gradually is young women are seeing in you a model. And I've always asked this question. It's a totally serious question. We all know how badly boys need male models. Otherwise, they don't know. They literally don't know how to grow up. Girls, I don't think, need a female model as much, but they need female models. It's not the same depth of need, they're not going to necessarily go wild, but uh, they girls need both. Girls need a male model and uh, and a female model. Boys need uh, a a male model particularly. But uh, having said that, I just tell you, and you know this to be true. My wife Sue, whom you know is quite special, <laughs> in many ways. <laughs> yes, in many ways. Uh, she, she was a single mom and she did a phenomenal job. So that, that, that is also a, a factor. It is an, I don't want to get into it, but it's an interesting question. Is one terrific parent at, enough to undo the damage of one bad parent? Mm. I don't have an answer, but that's it is, a, it's an that's interesting a ha- that's question. That's an ultimate issues hour question. It, yeah. Gosh, I have to tell you, your radio show is so unbelievable. I really, I mean, I've always had a sense of it, but when I guest hosted for you a few weeks ago, I did my third hour as I always do when I guest host for Dennis and I'm guest hosting for him in in the next few weeks. So look out for that. Anyway, I did a history hour on Iran, the -hmm. the history dating back to Mossadegh, bringing the Shah back, the 1979 revolution, just trying to understand how Iran got to the place that it is today. And we see every day in the news that it's a nightmare. I, Sean remembers this, I'm sure. After the first segment, you know, I open the show, I give the background, I say, uh, you know, doing this history hour on Iran, please call into the show, 18 Prager 776. We turn off the mic, Sean comes in, and we both think we're going to get no callers. None. We were so dead wrong. We got, not only did we get so many callers, there were Iranian Americans, there were people from, from, not in Iran, but but in the Middle East and in Europe who are Iranians who fled Iran calling. I was, I couldn't believe the reach. I could not believe it. And now that I'm guest hosting the next few weeks, every time I guest host with my history hours, because I used to do them basically on American history, I'm going to do international history because what you have in your audience is so unbelievable. I want all of these people right. to call in. Anyway. Well, now you know why I constantly refer to and speak about my talk show it is my laboratory of life because of all the people i talk with not to that's a separate issue with 
History repeats itself, and we're seeing that play out right now with inflation. When Jimmy Carter took office in the late 1970s, gold sold for $140 an ounce. By 1980, the price of gold topped out at $870 an ounce. If today's market performs like it did when Carter was in office, the price of gold could skyrocket from $1,800 an ounce to $9,300 an ounce. This is Julie Hartman for Amfed Coin and Bullion. Don't miss out on a great opportunity opportunity to purchase precious metals while prices are still sa- stable. If history repeats itself, we'll see a run on gold, silver, and platinum that could drive up prices. Be smart and consider buying now. At AmFed, you're dealing with specialists who provide you with personalized attention, honest information, and sound advice. You won't be pressured into buying outrageously so-called collectible coins or anything that you don't need. Take advantage of today's prices by going to AmFed Coin in Bullion. Call one 1-800-221-7694 or go to AmericanFederal.com. That's AmericanFederal.com. You know my theory, right? I, that I've spoken with more people than any living human being. I think that is true because I don't know who else is 40 years of talk radio. A lot of people talk, not a lot, but a fair number of talk to more people. But, true. But not yes, with. Yes, but your call are, I, I, right. No, I have, it's with. That's unique to talk radio. And, and so I know what you say is true. If I were to talk about Ar- Ar- Armenia and Turkey, Armenians would call in. Even some Turks would call in. Uh, and I, I love when they do. I learn from these people. I learned so much That's in that hour. Right. And I have yes. to tell you, I'm so annoyed. And, and just in the in the slight chance that he's listening, there was actually a man named Shaw him, himself who called in, an Iranian American, and he was so smart and so, I mean, the stuff that he told me. I think Iranians are particularly intelligent. If he's listening, Shaw, please email me. Yes, do that. I, I hate that I didn't get his contact information. What the Ayatollahs have done to Iran that country could be one of the most significant forces of good and influence in the world with the the raw brain power of that and culture power of that society and these islamists i I don't mean all muslims but these islamists so ruined a great place and the brain drain do you know how successful iranian immigrants are all over the world and they did, they did another thing, the Ayatollahs. They created the, the largest number of atheists in any one generation, really? I suspect, in history. Yeah. Young Iranians look at the is- Islam that they have been given. It's awful. It's, it's, it's evil. It's backward. It is intolerant. <laughs> it is sick. It's just sick. I mean, just look at the Salman Rushdie uh, fatwa. And uh, they say, oh, there's no God, which is an understandable reaction. I had that with Ayan Hirsi Ali, one of the greatest human beings, I think, alive. This woman is a true, true giant. She's brilliant and powerful and moral and cultured and everything and you, you would had Missy Alina Jad on the show too another that, that's right oh you Iranian know that, right yes fema- who's but a I just wanted to say about Ayan Hirsi Ali I've not not only had on the show I had at a Prager U event she's an atheist and and why because she grew up in in Somalia and 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 saw and and had the horrible uh, thing done to her that they do to girls I mean it, it's by the way, she's married, and and I believe happily so, to a great man, one of the greatest. You you like history. you got to read Neil Ferguson. Are you familiar with him? I'm not. N-I-A-L-L, spelled the English way. Neil Ferguson. He's a first-class historian. Have you met Iraqis? Or I'm sure you've met them, but have you met many Iraqis? Because I, I haven't. I haven't met many Iraqi Americans, and, and I was reading last night about... Uh, about the Iraq war and the sectarian conflict that emerged. And I didn't realize that Al-Qaeda came in after the Americans uh, toppled Saddam. I, I knew that there was Sunni and, and, and Shia sectarian conflict, but Al-Qaeda came into the country and wreaked a lot of havoc. And I just, I, reading about it really You know what Iraqi me. I had on my show? Yeah, who? Miss Iraq. Oh, you know I thought that was very interesting. Do you know why? They canceled the thing. No, it's no. They no. They did. 
It's a very interesting story. A few years ago, Miss Iraq took a selfie with Miss Israel. Oh, yes, 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 yes. She had to flee Iraq. Her whole family was threatened with death because she took a, p- a photo with Miss Israel. What was she like? Oh, well, she was classy. I mean, she 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 believes in goodness. <laughs> I know this this sounds corny, but I am just at the point in my life, and I I I hope and think that it will be this way for the rest of my life. I want to like grab the world and learn about all of it. Like I'm I am. Yes, that's how I feel. I'm like I felt every. Yep. It's almost sometimes painful for me. And you can do me. it. You can do it. I know I can, and I'm I, I'm so lucky, but I sort of like, my quest, again, I know it sounds so corny, my quest to learn is so deep that I, like, if I'm not learning at one moment, I'm thinking about all the rich things I could be learning about, and I, and then if I'm reading about Iraq, then I start th- wanting to read Bernard Shaw's book on Islam, and then I switch to that, and then I switch, so like, I'm just constantly moving about different things because I'm like, I is, want to satiate wait, my desire Bernard, to learn. Did you say Bernard Shaw? Oh, sorry, Bernard Lewis. Yes, yes his book Bernard, on Islam. George Bernard Shaw is the uh, English writer. Yeah. I'm aware, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no, I no, actually stole right. that Islam book from his, his yeah, library. Yeah, yeah, no, no. He, he, he uh, I was on a program with him some years ago. The man was in his mid-90s and gave a speech. Wow. He, he, he was- May that uh, be you. That's correct. That that that's right. That that would that would be my dream. That is exactly right. It is doable. Let's put it that way. It takes it takes luck and attitude, it, both. But I just I think about people who spend their lives scrolling on Instagram, or it's painful. Go, I mean, it's like I know. And by the way, I scroll on Instagram too. I'm not, you right. know, no, wagging no, no, no. my the, finger. The but the issue is how much. The world is so interesting. Yes, exactly. And I don't think people who who do that realize how interesting it is and literally just go to go to a bookstore my favorite thing is to go to a bookstore just browse pick out a great history book and your world is is just opened you got a slice of how interesting life is the the book the the institution of the book is one of the great gifts in the world when i think of how much this person worked so that I can digest in a few hours this massive amount of information and insight. I'm so grateful to them. And as an well, you author, would know. I do know. That's exactly right. Well, you know my motto, and, and th- this I do, I think, pretty well. I work hard so that the reader doesn't. I know. You said it to me yeah, the I, first time we that, ever met. The hardest part of my writing is to make it easily accessible because I I write on you know heavy heavy duty stuff talking about heavy duty stuff so you attended my ask a Jew ask a Gentile event which I do around the country for the last I've done it for years and this time it was it should be called by the way I don't know why they do ask a Jew ask a Gentile not ask a Jew ask a Christian but it, it, it rings better, Jew and Gentile. Yeah, but. maybe so. Okay, I mean, it's not a big deal. I'm just saying, though, it, it, it's always a committed Christian that I'm in dialogue with. And this time it was Eric Metaxas, who is truly a significant thinker and writer and gutsy. That's what I like about him. So what did you think of the evening? Because you had already read Metaxas's biography of Luther. Of Luther. I loved it. And... <laughs> Remember when I walked? I walked into the green room before they they went on, and you were sitting with Eric and and your family members and friends, and you you all were talking. And I just saw him, and I just walked up to him, and I was like, "I love you, I love your book." And then I realized, oh God, why did I say that? That was. I, I think he was happy to hear it. Uh, yes, it was just it was a little awkward. He probably didn't think so. I'm just being self-conscious. Anyway, I, I, the reason why I pull out my phone is because I took notes throughout the, the entire speech. I didn't bring my notebook. I mean, you mean not speech. Uh, Sorry, dialogue, dialogue. dialogue. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, just this was a really big moment of the night. I think you, you would agree. When Eric talked about faith and works in Christianity. Because that's something that we discuss on the show uh, a lot that... that Historically, or sort of traditionally, people understand Christianity to be faith-based, 
and Christ, indeed Christians understand Christianity to be primarily faith-based. If you believe in Christ and in God, you'll go to heaven. If you don't, you will go elsewhere. I thought Eric clarified the point very well, where he said that faith, well, he, he quoted the James uh, verse where he said, faith without works is dead. And he said, you know your faith by your works. That's that's what indicates. That's right. But I guess my follow-up question for him, and I'd like to ask you as my convenient spokesperson, at least for right now, of Christianity. So let's say... Which is ironic, given that right, I, I'm, of course I'm, I'm it a is. Jew, but I, I but, can be. But that was a theme of, of the yes, night, too, that, right. that you're so trusted and, and loved by Christians, and you understand Christianity so much, and you don't have a theological axe to grind with That's them, right. that you can, at least in terms of this conversation, serve as a spokesperson. Anyway, my question for Eric and for you is... I understand his argument that the works reveal the faith, but let's say you have someone who is very, you know, who does good works, but then if you ask them if they believe in Christ, they kind of go, eh, I don't know. They're, they're a church-going Christian, but they are they can't fully buy that Christ was resurrected, for instance. Would that person be considered a Christian? Because by all other marks, they fit the Christian category, but they can't go all the way with that one belief. How do you think he'd respond? So I'm thinking because I want to do compl complete justice, obviously, to, to Christians. I think you have to affirm the, the Nicene Creed in order to be considered Christian in, in normative churches. I think that would be Catholic and, and Protestant. And, and basically that there is the God, the Father, the Son, and, and the Holy Spirit. I do. It's an interesting question I never thought to ask. Does any other belief, is there any other belief necessitated for you to be considered a Christian? Because Christian is defined by beliefs. Judaism is defined by beliefs and also birth. This is a huge difference between between the two groups, and, and I'm just making that clear. And primarily works. No, 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 but whether you are a Jew. Oh, I see, okay. You could be a bad Jew, but you're still a Jew. So uh, you, it's an interesting question. Do, does a person, if a person says, I believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but uh, you know what? I just can't wrap my head around the resurrection. Is that person considered by by Christians, by Christian theologians, a Christian? I can't answer on their behalf. Uh, it is is in other words, in in effect, the question is: Is the resurrection as central as the Trinity? Well, I can only say I've never met anybody who believed in the Trinity but not the resurrection. It's an interesting theoretical. I don't know if, if, if it actually happens. Yeah, it's just interesting to contemplate where the line gets drawn because when Eric says, you know, your works sort of reveal your faith, your works certainly reveal if you take Jesus and his values or God and his values seriously, but that does not necessarily reveal whether you believe in the divinity of Christ and you know, the, I mean, obviously the crucifixion right. historically what, happened. By, but. by your uh, works, is your your faith is known, is meant, I believe, to say as follows. You can say you believe in Christ till the cows come home. But if you don't act in a Christ-like manner, which doesn't mean perfect, but if you act, let's say, if you do evil, right, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. It mean you're fooling uh, us and you're fooling yourself that you really believe as a Christian. That's what I. That's what that statement of, of Metaxas and of James I think means. Don't fool yourself. Uh, it, it's like the. I mean, to a certain extent, it's like the guy who. Oh, I love my my wife slash girlfriend, and I periodically beat her. So uh, I think it's fair for one to say you may think you love her, but your beating her seems to invalidate that sentiment. Right.
The, what you just said reminded me of a great point that you made in, in the discussion where you said, it doesn't matter what Jews believe or what Christians believe. The question is, what does Judaism hold or what does Christianity hold? I thought yes. that was really, really important. Oh, I'm glad. Well, you, you always pick up on, on the really important stuff. Yeah, that's, look, that's why I know this is a Jew. People say, so Dennis, why don't Jews believe about the afterlife? And my answer is, it's irrelevant. The question is, what does Judaism believe about the afterlife? It's it's like, you might as well say, what do Jews believe about the Sabbath? Most Jews don't observe the Sabbath. I was, but, yeah. so, so who cares? I mean, it's sad, but it, it doesn't reflect on whether Judaism believes in the Sabbath. It's, it's one of the, it's the fourth commandment of the Ten Commandments. Your argument about the Sabbath was so good, too, where you said you're only following nine of the Ten Commandments. Oh, and I said it to, yeah, the thousand Christians who were present. Yes. Well, that that is an interesting... It, I've only asked it. I never asked to win an argument. I have no interest in winning theological arguments because theology is is a set of beliefs. I never argue beliefs anyway. I argue values and, and a whole host, but I don't argue beliefs. Anyway, uh, this uh, is a, a case of... What, what was this? What was the point you just made? Because I was when I was just thinking Shabbat, about Shabbat. The nine you you're only yes. observing nine of the ten, and you say you don't. It doesn't matter to win an argument to you. That's right. Well, it was uh, darn. It rarely happens, but it hey, happens. Hey, you know what? There's a Dennis and Julie bingo that Zach and Sean and, and Rick yes, made. Yes, and what is it? And Oh, it's so funny. It, it totally ribs us. And one of them is Julie forgets what she's going to say. I'm very happy with this moment right now, Dennis, because maybe we have to add uh, one. Uh, Dennis forgets what he's That's now. right, which is, I think, uh, <laughs> no, it doesn't ha- rarely rare. happens. Yes, it does. It shows how, how relaxed we are. Well, it, it yes. Also... By the way, I have a whole theory on that, like I do on most things. Shocking. Yes. Uh, you know what I do not to lose my uh, place? This is hilarious. Oh, it's so great. You ought to put this up on your I thing. did, I did. That is very... Dennis, it's the mic. Oh, <laughs> 57. <didn't>... Dennis. <laughs> it also says... um. Uh, Julie talks about Harvard kind of hurt, I got to say. Oh, I I that is so it. unfair. Thank you. Oh, You're making please. me out to be like, I that went to is, Harvard. It is you know? not true. Thank you. Oh, I'm looking at Sean, who should, you know. I don't talk about it that much. It's Lent, Sean. It's when Dennis brings it up. Brings it up. That Thank you. That you are sinning during Lent. Even though you're a lapsed Catholic, it should mean something to you. And where were your ashes yesterday? One of them is they compliment each other. Oh, you, you okay. That I don't care about that. I, I can live with that. <laughs> the uh, left is destroying blank. The left destroys everything. Let's just well, be honest. It does, yes. So here is okay, I was, what I was going to say on, on, on the uh, issue of not forgetting where I was. I always go off on tangents in speeches, on the radio show, and with us. Because it's interesting and relevant. The tangent is not completely unrelated. So how do I know where to go back? Do you know what I do? And you should do this. I actually say a word in my mind so that I remember the subject that I went off from on the tangent. I do that too, actually. And if you don't do it, it's extremely hard to remember. Sometimes I just write down the word. Okay, yeah, but uh, during a speech, it's it's harder. Or I mean, you're right; it, it's worth doing. Anyway, uh, so th- the evening was this dialogue, and you uh, you you raised this issue. The Sabbath issue for Christians has always intrigued me. Uh, when I started having serious dialogues with Christians, which I did for 10 years on the radio each week, I I realized they were completely conflicted on the Sabbath commandment. This is not an attack. It's not a criticism. It's a lament because if you don't have the Sabbath in your life, it's poorer. 
Just when you thought it couldn't get any better, Mike Lindell with MyPillow is launching the MyPillow 2.0. When Mike invented MyPillow, it added everything you could ever want in a pillow. Now, nearly 20 years later, he discovered a new technology that makes it even better. The MyPillow 2.0 has the patented adjustable fill of the original MyPillow, and now with a brand new fabric that is made with a temperature regulating thread. The MyPillow 2.0 is the softest, the smoothest, and the coolest pillow you will ever own. For our exclusive listeners, the MyPillow 2.0 is buy one, get one free with the promo code Hartman. MyPillow 2.0 temperature regulating technology is 100% made in the USA and comes with a 10-year warranty and a 60-day money-back guarantee. Just go to MyPillow.com and click on the radio listener square to get the buy one, get one free offer. Enter the promo code Hartman or call 1-800-566-6745 to get your MyPillow 2.0s now. What specifically were they conflicted about? Did they argue that that Sunday and going to church? No, was... the co- conflict was: uh, Am I, as a Christian, commanded by the Ten Commandments to keep the Sabbath? And and it's fifty fifty the results that I get. So I have a question for you. Something that you brought up during the discussion that I'm embarrassed that I I don't know. You were. S- talking about and I, I think it was with regard to to this very point the sabbath what commandments or what laws in the in the uh, old testament as the christians well call really it, the torah because there are no laws after the torah right. the first five books yeah which christians are obligated to follow and you said something along the lines of jesus fulfilled some or which ones jesus didn't fulfill according to the christian worldview what so Again, I'm, I'm embarrassed that I don't know this, but why do Christians believe that they are not obligated to some of the, the ritual laws, for well, instance, right, so you, you're asking, or parts of see, the Ten this Commandments? this is where we really need a Christian. It's not fair for Christians that I, I, I am, I, I try to defend, I defend Christians my, my whole life, in fact, because <laughs> uh, if Christianity, Christianity dies, the West dies, which is what is happening. Uh, but uh, it... There are times where I will admit I just can't provide as eloquent a defense as a Christian might because I don't understand the basic, basic Christian concept. I've never actually said this. I should say it at one of these dialogues, actually, because I feel totally free to say anything, which is a credit to the Christians. That they, you know, thousand Christians come to hear a Jew say what he thinks about Christianity. There's no other religion that would do that. It, it, it is so, uh, I don't think anyway. Uh, so when Christians say Jesus fulfilled the law, have you heard that? You've never heard that statement? Honestly, no, until yeah. you said it the other night. Well, or that, you mentioned that, well, that Christians they believe say that. It. Christians right. say that. So I have heard this for literally uh, 50 years, since since I was very young. And I didn't understand it 50 years ago, and I don't understand it today. There is a notion in Christianity, and this is where I wish we did have a Christian present. There's a notion in Christianity that because the law cannot be perfectly fulfilled, we need a savior. We mean, presumably, anybody. Well, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but why can it not be perfectly fulfilled? Well, no law can be perfectly fulfilled. It's not, the human being is not capable. So how of does the savior do that? Because that that's the point. So I, I hope I'm not misconstruing Christian thought. But and I, write to us. Please but write yeah, to well, us, obviously. All right, but I, but I just say, I, it's not like, I heard this once, I've heard this for half a century, so I think I'm getting it right, that because, this is Paul's notion, because, it's in the New Testament, Paul says, because the law uh, is a curse, and Jesus is is in effect a blessing, and it's a curse because no one can fulfill it, and therefore you you are you are doomed, as it were, uh, by by your non fulfillment. Anyway, I, I don't want to get into the the weeds here. I can, 
I know what he was referring to. There is no concept in the Torah, in the Old Testament, in Judaism, that if you can't fulfill all the laws, you go to hell. There, there is no, it would, I think it makes God look foolish. I'm giving you laws, I know you can't fulfill them, and I'm going to punish you for not fulfilling them, and then I'll send a savior so that you are bailed out because I knew you couldn't fulfill them. The purpose of the law is not to curse uh, uh, the individual, obviously, and God doesn't believe we can do it perfectly. That's why there... If you, if you dr- drop one or you, you're mistaken, you bring an atonement sacrifice. And if you couldn't do it with an animal, then you brought it with grain. Uh, it, it Does anybody fulfill any set of laws perfectly? Does anybody drive perfectly? It's easier to drive perfectly than it is to, to live ethically perfectly. The, the purpose of the law is to make you a better person and to bring you closer to God. And, 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 and that's, that's, the, that's the whole purpose. Anyway, why did you raise this? Because it was raised on, at, in the yes, evening? Yes, it was, it was something that, that I was contemplating and was a bit confused about. But um, I, I'd like to raise something else. Just Again, I'm just talking about my impressions and things I took notes about. By the way, people will be able to watch the evening. I, I'm sure it's going oh, to go yes, up that's on, right. on, on the internet. Yes, it was filmed. Yes, so, okay. Something else, and I know that, that you say this too, but I, I, it's such a good point, one that we need to remind ourselves of, of often. Eric Metaxas said during this, this talk, he said, evil is hatred of God. That's right. He said, people doing evil in our country right now they are at war with god's reality they want to deconstruct and destroy god's reality male and female good and evil he he mentioned marriage and then he also said a few seconds later he said they want to get a god i thought i thought those were two excellent points not only is it a a hatred of this God and his reality, but also in it, and this is, you know, Dennis Prager, one of Dennis Prager's big points is that no one is, no one is without religion. No, it's not that if you believe in, in, don't believe in God, you believe in nothing, you believe in anything. And I think they're, they are looking to believe in something. They're looking for their own God while trying to well, deconstruct this. The song. irony is they are their God. Right. They have found him. It is they. Their rabid commitment to their stupid well, ideology. Well, well, if you if you say that it doesn't matter if you're a boy or a girl and you are born one, that they have reduced it to assigned the sex you're assigned at birth. That's that's like the the number of fingers you were assigned at birth, you weren't assigned a number of fingers. You were born with a number of fingers. You're born a boy or you're born a girl. Right. The one out of millions, I don't know, one out of 10 million, what I think is called hermaphrodite, where there there are uh, uh, amb- ambiguous genitalia. I mean, it doesn't prove anything. There, there are people who were born who are not capable of seeing. But blindness is not normal. Yes. Yes. Oh, gosh. Now I'm forgetting what I was going to say. Congratulations to you, someone at home who's, who's playing the bingo. Hey, that's one on the bingo. You need five or something like that. Oh, gosh. What, what was it? Oh, yes, I remember. See, does it count if I remember? Yes, it does. So you drop it. And by the way, I remember because I used, I put a word in my head so that as I'm getting off on this tangent, I don't. It's, you did do that? I, I just say it right now. The word is inversion. Yes. I'll tell you. It works. It, yes. What's so eerily uh, fascinating about leftism is that it really is a direct inversion of God's values. Like it's it's it really is so stark the way that they are rebelling against a Judeo-Christian God. I mean, everything, even if you just look at the few chapters of Genesis, when you talk about 
the distinctions that what God does when he's creating the world, the first thing he does is he makes distinctions between light and dark, between land and sea, between male and female, between holy and profane, between man and animal, between clothed and unclothed, the list goes on. And what the what they are trying to do in each of those situations, I mean, not land and sea, but if they could, they might, because they would say that it's, you know, terribly bigoted for land to be land and not sea. My point is, it's just, it's so stark the way that the, the left directly retaliates against each of God's principles. I mean, it's like a direct I negative want to write photographic a piece image. Judeo-Christian values versus leftist values. It's it's the, it's opposite. It's They're just opposite. opposite. Oh, it is. It's exactly correct. And it correct. shows it shows that the that that leftists that's really at the heart of their It is the heart of everything. of their problem because it, yep. it would be similar to if I were a Dr. Marber, if I were a therapist and someone came into my office and was sitting across from me and was, you know, had really like straggly hair and and was wearing bad clothes and was smoking a cigarette whatever and then that person's mother came in and was perfectly dressed and put together and i would speculate that that child was rebelling against the mother because it's so it's such an inversion that is exactly what's going on here that's a brilliant analogy our listeners know that we come from two very different generations. One of us comes from a generation that has embodied the American dream, and the other comes from one who believes that it may not be possible anymore. But the American dream is still possible, and investing makes it easier. That's why I'm excited to introduce you to our friends at monorail.com, America's investing app. The investing app made by patriots for patriots. Monorail loves America, and they're true conservatives who will help Help you invest in companies that love America too. They take the guesswork out of investing. Link your bank account to the Secure Monorail app and start investing with as little as $5. Monorail offers fractional shares in high priced stocks so you can be a big player without the price tag. It only costs $3 a month or save money and pay just $17.76 a year. Catch that? $17.76? I told you that they love America. Pro investment, pro America money movement, and pro America. American Dreams, monorail.com. Download the app today or go to monorail.com to get started. That was excellent. Oh, thank you. See, as I, it shows me, as I was saying it, I thought, God, this is so bad. He's going to think this is so bad. The I audience was, is going to think this I is bad. I thought it was superb. Thank you. That is, wow. Th- I mean, I'm, yes, I'm thrilled. Yes, you have given me a way Because I always think in terms of analogies, and I always think in terms of uh, of physical. For example, how do I? How have I all my life explained humans are created in God's image, and animals are not? If your dog and a stranger were drowning, which would you say first? It's so real, and that that it, it makes the point. Your point was superb. This guy is totally disheveled, stinks. Yeah. Uh, uh, is foul mouth and and his perfectly uh, uh, clean o- ordered, <laughs> clean, distinguished, classy mother sh- shows up or father. Yeah, it's so obvious that is exactly what the left is. It is a rebellion against their orderly father. It's it's exactly what right. it is. If you look, I mean, again, one of one of the 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 guideposts of judeo-christian of the judeo-christian worldview is the distinction between male and female that's right and and they're totally rebelling against that you know holy and profane they do that every day and and ironically the, the only distinctions that they emphasize are completely the opposite of Judeo-Christian yes, views. Yes, God doesn't give a damn about your color. Ex- yes, it's true. What you write in the Torah commentary is God is ethic-centric, not ethnic-centric. Yes. The left is the exact inversion. That's They're right. They're ethnic-centric. They, they, if if someone does commits an act, we judeo-christian conservative abiding people can tell you who was right and who was wrong based on the act the left is will tell you who was right and who was wrong based on the race of the people who committed the act that's right that's right they ask who not what yep I'm seeing if I have one more point to bring up from this there were so many great ones yeah I will announce it when uh Sean, do you have any idea when the Metaxas oh. Prager thing goes up? 
Sometime next week. Cool. Just also very interesting, too. Eric said that, or maybe it was you that, who said it, that in um, the book of Revelation, yeah. which, by the way, I know is Revelation instead That's of Revelations, right. That's correct. even though there are multiple, what, the thing that casts you into the fiery lake, fiery lake, excuse me, is cowardice. That's one of the that things. That was a great point. That, I, I love that point. Of that. So you will love this. I uh, I came up with a, with a talk and something I just wrote for Larry Elder's upcoming book because he's running for president and he asked me to write something for it. So I I devoted an entire hour of my radio show to this brand new theory of mine, the four characteristics of a great person. Oh, I am so eager to oh, hear. Oh, I have no doubt you are. Oh, gosh. So, he, so... I'm thinking of I, mine. I, yes, you know what? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> next, next... Next week? Yes, let's talk oh, about good. it. Oh, that's good. And wait, here's even better. Should everyone aspire to being great? Well, you... I actually was thinking about that before the show because you were doing an ad read for your radio show. And and the ad read started off where you said there are people who fight and there are people who support those who fight. Right. It's not an exact, you know, parallel to this point, but but I... Do you see why I'm bringing up that quote with this? Yes, but... Of course, people... Supporting the fighters is a good thing. Right, but being... So uh, not everyone can be great. But no, are you saying every, they no, that's stri- it. I have changed should my strive mind. strive to be great. Is everyone, that what you're asking? Everyone can be great. Not everyone can do macro great things. Right. That, that you have to be right. in a macro position to do macro great things. So it, you, you, it's like you, the fighter you, supporter point. You need people well, who are doing macro great things. No, and- it isn't exactly because... The supporter is doing great things, so I, I I would I would leave that aside. I understand you're right to a certain extent. I really want people to think though over the over the next week is because your answer would have been mine until I thought this through. I think everyone should aspire to greatness, and when I give the four characteristics of great you will realize they are accessible to everyone. I agree with you that everyone should aspire to be great. I think maybe I'm misunderstanding your question. Right, but not everybody can be because they can. Okay. Being great and doing large, great things are not the same thing. True. Well, uh, it, it, it accords with my wonderful, if I have to say so, and, and it's not even fully original to me, so I, I don't mean wonderful that I came up with it. But I've said for years, and it's really important for people to know, the famous are rarely significant, and the significant are rarely famous. See, let us say, let me, I'll, I'll put it to you in very personal terms in your life. Your sister, who was who quite severely autistic, your, your sister has not had particularly good help. But let us say you found someone who devoted a good chunk of their life to making your sister laugh, comfortable, uh, secure. Would you deny that this person was great? By the way, we do have a person. Her name's Diane. She listens. I want to give her a shout out because she's a godsend. But um, would I deny that that person is great? I think I'd be insane to deny that that person is great. Okay, so that's my point. You don't have to do great things like Winston Churchill to be great. Right, but I view that I, I view that as a macro great thing. Which Churchill or the? Oh no, no. What the? What? What Diane has done is micro. It's not macro. It's done to one person. Because it's an individual, right. Yes. In my life, it's macro, but I I hear that. Absolutely greatness is available to everyone. It's amazing how these things develop. So do you know, we'll end with this because I'm so excited as you you are, which is one of the many reasons I love you. And uh, it is, it, it is how it happened. So Larry Elder asked me to write a piece for his book about his running for president. And I, and I 
I'm the I'm the one who brought Larry to public life, and it's one of the greatest things I ever did in this country. And we're very close and have been for decades. So of course I said yes, I'll write this for you. And but I never ever ever write pablum. It, it is like a sin, a big sin. If I am going to write something, even just 700 words, they have to be meaningful or I've wasted my time and the reader's time. And so I thought, what can I write for Larry? Well, I think Larry is a great man. I really do. And then I thought, well, why is he great? And then, I, and that's how it happened. I came up with four characteristics. I spoke about it the same day I wrote this piece for Larry, just, just this past week, at a PragerU donor uh, board meeting. And the, I saw these really highly competent and, and uh, good. successful and good people taking notes. Because if you say to somebody, there are two big questions here. This is like a trailer for next week. Isn't it funny? Because we never did this before. But it's so important. A, should everyone aspire to greatness? My answer is yes. And B, what does it mean? So I want you to come up by next week with four, or if it's five, fine, three, fine, I don't care, but a handful of characteristics of what it means to be great. And, and I, have, I have my four. Deal. And the audience should do it too. And you, that's exactly right. But first answer the question. The, the fact that you had your response is my, my worry People think greatness is only available if you're in a very high, powerful position in media or in politics, but it's not true. Greatness is available. So I asked, here's a, here's a beauty. As I get the chills. This is so powerful to me. Ask yourself, I'm saying this to, to those listening to us, do you know anyone in your life that you would say is a great person? By the way, if you don't, it's, it's very sad. But if you do, and not uncommon, probably. Unfortunately, I don't. I don't know. That's an. Mm. I I need to do this on the radio. This is where I. That's why I call my radio show. That's a perfect. That's why example. I brought up the Iran thing because you can just that, get yes. so many callers who who have a. By connection the way, to when you sit in for me uh, in the not too distant future, you should always feel free if you hear a point we raise on this or or I just raise on my show and say, I want to give you Julie's take on Dennis's thing about great people. He made me think. It's a great idea. Yes, he made me think, and I'd like your feedback. I'm just sitting here thinking how lucky I am that I'm 23 years old, and I get to basically do these seminars on life and character. Oh, you're very lucky. Including the one next week. So, that I get to think about this and talk about it with all of you. That's really it. Is. You're a hundred percent right. Unique. I never, I never stop pinching myself over my luck in having had this. At the same time, it, 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 it you're very lucky. There's no question, but you, you have, you have earned it. Now there are people who earn it, and they're not that lucky. They're. they're they get a disease or they're hit by a truck or they, they don't meet the right people. I mean, a million things. That's another great subject. Did we ever do luck? Sean? I know I'm the human recording device. Yes, I think, you are the human recording I don't think device. we've ever spent a, a long time talking about it. I think it, offhandedly it we have. It disturbs people a great deal when I, uh, religious people, they think I am denying God's power when I say that there is a lot of luck in life. I'm not finding it in any of the Yeah, all yeah, right. So that's another that's another great, great subject that's great. to write down. How do reach oh my gosh. Okay, we do this yeah, every how week. Do, how do people reach We do you? this every week and I hope it's not annoying Why would to it be people. Annoying? I don't that's just the way my mind works. You know, my tortured little mind. That is so true. I know. Okay. Uh, again, when I was giving that analogy of the disheveled, I okay. was like, oh, this I don't is, care if we're delaying crap. it. I have one more point to make. Oh, God. I'm sorry. You got to be quick. So be it. No, because I'm filming after. I don't care. I'm very selfish. This You will love this. 
quickly. You, Julie at julie-hartman.com. Follow Dennis Julie Pod. That's it. Go. Okay. So you and your mind, and you're always thinking, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? What did I get wrong? I don't know. What did I look wrong? What did I think wrong? Right? Yes. So Sadly. I was speaking to a board member last night. A Prager you. Prager you. And his wife is a surgeon, a very talented surgeon. She said, as a general rule, women make better surgeons. And she's no feminist. And I thought, I, if she says it, I take it seriously. And she said, I'll tell you why. When, when a woman does a surgery, all she thinks about is, what did she get wrong? Totally. Oh, when I believe guys it. do surgery, they think, oh, I did a good job. I'm going golfing now. Oh, it's true. Dennis and I, we were talking about... Isn't that interesting? It's totally. We were, Remember we were on the phone and you said something like, uh, we were talking about an idea and you said, oh, when I think of a good idea, I think that was a great idea, Dennis. When I think of a good idea, I think, why didn't I think of it sooner? What don't I know about yes. it? Why am I? Why have I been a lazy bum that I haven't written it down and tried to you know, flush it out? All right, how Male do they reach female. you? Tell them I already told them. Julie at julie-hartman.com and a Dennis Julie pod on Instagram and Twitter. Bless you. Bless me. Oh, thank yes. you. I thought I sneezed. I thought you were saying it. No, you didn't bad. sneeze. Bless you too, Dennis. Thank Bless you. all of you.